Dr. Vasant Kumar is well known as agri scientist, science writer, teacher, and a social worker. More than that, he is a good human. He is uh, alumni of our university. He did MSc in botany, MPhil in seed pathology, and PhD in applied botany from University of Mysore. He started his career as a lecturer in applied botany of University of Mysore in the year 1984. But later on 1987, he quit the university job and joined the seed industry as research pathologist. He has served in Pioneer Overseas Corporation for nine years and then three years in Sunseed and Nimens Seeds. He has also served as a technical advisor to National Dairy Development Board, Bioseed Genetics India. Reliance, BASC, and other organizations. He also has served as a member of Task Force on Biological Agent in Agriculture of DBT, Government of India, and also in a special committee on Agri Biotechnology of Government of Karnataka. He has founded a voluntary organization called Krishi Gnana Vignana Vedike, through which he conducted free training programs for farmers on various aspects of agriculture, horticulture, and biotechnology. Apart from being a good practical pathologist, he is also recognized as a popular science writer and a professional photographer. He has moved all over the uh, world, many countries he has visited, and acquired a lot of knowledge related to his field. He was also served as a honorary technical advisor to the past Minister for Agriculture, Government of Karnataka. And he has published good number of papers, articles, research articles, and books. Recently, he has published a monumental book, Plant Doctor. And it is it held as a Bhagavad Gita or Bible for all those who are involved in agriculture. Another book published by him in Kannada, it is a Krishi, Krishi Lokadulagi. Dr. Vasant Kumar is an innovative, self-styled scientist who has introduced novel methods in disease management. And he has solved many hard uh, to control diseases like wilt disease of black pepper, tobacco, chrysanthemum, and many other crops. His product Power Plus is the first product which cures several viral diseases, including papaya ring spot virus. And to his credit, he was awarded many awards and honors, Karnataka Rajyotsava Award, Best Scientist Communicator Award, Agriculture Extension Service Award, Karnataka Kamini Award, Farmer Friend Agriculture Scientist Award, uh, Golden Jubilee uh, Global H U Award, and many more to his uh, credit. So with this brief biodata, it's a pleasure for all of us to, in, uh, to welcome you, sir, for this webinar series. Over to you, sir, Thank please. You. Well, good evening uh, to all of you. And uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Professor uh, Suturu Malini, who is the chairperson of uh, Department of Studies in Zoology and Department of Studies in Genetics, who is also a well-known scientist and a science writer. And uh, especially welcome uh, veterans in the field. I'm very happy that they have joined today, Professor T.M. Manjunath, Dr. Sharan Nangadi, uh, Dr. Ashwath, Dr. Subramanya and uh, Sri Vasant Kumar Mysore Mat, uh, all these veterans uh, and my good friends and well wishers have joined. I am very happy. At the same time, I am a little nervous because they are there. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate all the students uh, who have joined uh, this uh, program. Today, I am asked to speak on. Uh, green revolution to gene revolution, which is very pertinent to the subject uh, genetics, because all agricultural revolutions have happened because of uh, developments which have happened in the field of genetics. So with this brief introduction, uh, I would like to start with my slides. Oh, 
Oh, well, uh, as I said, my topic is uh, green revolution to gene revolution. Friends, uh, we all know that food is the first and uh, foremost basic need of all human beings. Without food, we can't survive. And uh, food is not just a thing to eat. It, for a country, it can be a weapon. It gives you the strength. It uh, gives you the peace. It gives you the freedom. And it gives you the sovereignty. Without enough food in the world, the peace cannot prevail in the world. And this food is not manufactured in the factories. It is actually produced in the fields, as we all know. And it is produced by farmers. And COVID-2019 has taught many lessons to all of us. And one of them is that we can survive without anything, but not without food. We survived without medication. There was no medication, actual medication for uh, COVID. There was no vaccination until recently we got it. And, uh, but we couldn't survive without food. And it is not just pandemic of COVID. It is uh, after this pandemic of hunger has, uh, also has started. And malnutrition has surged because of lockdown. And uh, many people are um, struggling for their food, daily food. And food is the biggest, uh, hunger is the biggest virus in the world, actually. But nobody bothers about it because it, is, it doesn't bother the rich people. This hunger virus bothers only the poor people and uh, downtrodden people. And the vaccine is available but still they suffer every day. And the food, as I said, agriculture is the one which produces all our food. 80% of our food from, comes from agriculture. And agriculture is not just the area where food is produced. It is mother of all cultures, mother of all religions, mother of all languages, mother of all industries, and mother of all economies. For your information, last year, due to lockdown, every GDP of every industry, every area went down. The only positive growth was seen in agriculture. And our first five minister said, anything can stop, but not agriculture. Okay, our second prime minister said, knowing the importance of food security, as well as border security, he said, Jai Jawan, for border security, Jai Kisan for food security. And we all know many of us who were born before 1960s, we have experienced the hunger. And during 60s, uh, we had political freedom, but no, no freedom from hunger. The then government was ready to extend any sort of help to increase the food production. And the prime minister at that time was our uh, Srimati Indira Gandhi. She gave all the support. She invited Professor and Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, and she said, I, I am ready to give any sort of uh, help to you to increase uh, food production. And we had the situation called, uh, during 1960s, we had the situation called ship to mouth situation. Only when the U US ship arrived in India, Indian people had food. And it was possible because of the kindness of American people. They donated. Uh, extra food uh, which was produced there uh, to our people and we all survived and I am one, one of them. And uh, during midday meal, uh, the food what was given during our high school time was uh, the upito or uh, upuma prepared out of uh, this uh, maize and uh, wheat and uh, red jola. Okay, and then green revolution happened and because of uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug's uh, revolutionary research in plant breeding, uh, he developed uh, high yielding uh, dwarf varieties of uh, rust resistant uh, wheat varieties. Because of that, green revolution happened. And it opened up a plethora of opportunities to increase yields in all other crops like rice, maize, sorghum, and varieties of pulses and vegetables and so on. So, because of this, we saw the Green Revolution. And uh, Green Revolution factors were basically genetics. So many revolutions have happened, as I said already. And because of uh, improvement in genetics, high yielding varieties were developed. 
they may be open pollinated varieties or hybrids and nowadays we even have a gm crop that is genetically modified crops and to get the full genetic potential of these high yielding varieties we needed additional nutrition through chemical fertilizers and we needed additional water and we developed irrigation facilities we built a lot of river dams bore wells sprinkler irrigation nowadays we have varieties of irrigation systems because of the combination of all these we are uh, able to produce enough and more food today and uh, as i said seeds that is genetics fertilizers pesticides and water these were the key factors in green revolution so because of this there was surge in production food production surplus production and rice is the most important uh, food crops and uh, hybrids came in uh, uh, initially high yielding uh, open uh, pollinated varieties came and then chinese research uh, gave us lot of uh, uh, scope for developing hybrid rice and uh, of course in vegetables fruits everywhere we got uh, hybrids and because of this enough and more production we the governments had the courage to bring food security bill that is the right to food so nobody should go hungry and uh, on any day uh, because of this security bill the uh, anybody can get food from the government and uh, indian agriculture uh, as you know indian agriculture is the main occupation of india it is an agrarian country before green revolution the situation was 70 to 80% of the workforce was involved in agriculture we were able to produce only 50 million metric tons and we had 50 million uh, 50 crore people but we didn't have enough food for 50 crore people today we are 140 crore people and the gdp share was more than 50% during that time and the situation was called ship to mouth situation today after the green revolution as and today uh, the workforce in agriculture has come down to 50% and 300 million metric tons of food uh, grains are being produced in india alone and 20% of the gdp it was less than uh, 17% uh, till last year and after 17 years the gdp share has jumped to 20% because gdp share of other areas came down and we are self sufficient in food and other areas but after 50 years of green revolution there is a fatigue in green revolution so this is the article sometime back in india today grain drain and there is so much evolution is happening in fruit and vegetable production we have crossed the 300 million metric tons even in uh, horticulture crops now the challenge is because the population is ever increasing we the challenge in front of is to produce more from less that is more not just food it should be nutritious and it should be safe so but more nutritious and safe food from uh, food for, has to be produced from less land less water less labor less chemicals and at less cost and how to increase food production the first option in front of is to uh, increase the area under crop production as we all know it is impossible because actually the area under cultivation is shrinking because we are building uh, cities roads industries in our agricultural areas a uh, second option is to increase uh, the uh, productivity of the crops by increasing their genetic potential that we have already seen a plateau because of uh, uh already we have developed high yielding varieties and further increase is not so easy the third option is to reduce losses due to biotic and abiotic stresses maybe pests and diseases and drought resistance salinity resistance all that if we can bring we can produce little more food uh, production as i said we have uh, biotic and abiotic uh, uh, stresses these are the ones i will not go into the details of that so another interesting thing is that uh, despite the use of pesticide uh, um, we are losing 32 billion us dollars worth crop every year in uh, in india alone the major pests are weeds diseases insects rodents birds and others so if we can reduce losses due to these 
we can make that much more food available to the people. One second. Ah, okay. So how do we reduce them? There are uh, mainly four options in front of us to reduce losses due to diseases. One is legislation, that is through quarantine system. Everyone knows the word quarantine now, but it's a very common word in uh, plant field, agriculture field. And another is eradication, like we, are, uh, we have eradicated many human diseases uh, in the past, including polio. And uh, that is not possible in uh, crop diseases. The third option, but most commonly used option is protection. That is by using chemicals, protective chemicals, we can reduce the losses. But the last one, host resistance, is the most practical and cheapest method of disease or insect control. Earlier, we used to say that spray or pray. So when chemicals survived, uh, before the chemicals arrived, we used to only pray the God to control our diseases or insects. But after chemicals came in, we started spraying. But even after spraying several uh, kinds of pesticides, still we are getting the diseases and insects. So we have to both spray and pray now. And uh, because of this ease of using these chemicals, we started using chemicals indiscriminately. But it is knowledge-based technology. So we need to diagnose the problem specifically and specific recommendations are to be given uh, so that it will be safe. But because of lack of proper knowledge, uh, we are using, especially in a country like India, where most of the farmers are illiterate and uneducated, and they don't have a proper knowledge uh, for the use of right chemicals. They are using them indiscriminately. And because of this, we are facing a lot of health hazards. We are causing environmental pollution. We have a lot of residual effect. Because of this residual effect, a lot of our export consignments are being rejected in other countries. Especially recently, Basmati has been rejected by US. And uh, because of continuous usage of these chemicals, pathogens and pests are developing resistance. They are not uh, being controlled by any of these latest chemicals. And in country like India, adulteration of these chemicals will happen because of that, again, the efficacy of uh, pesticides uh, uh, is coming down. And farmers should have the knowledge of what kind of pesticide, what, what dosage, what is the timing, how should be the coverage, what should be the interval? And this is in a, a real education needed by farmers. Because of lack of this education and knowledge, farmers are helpless and they are losing crops despite the use of these chemicals. And we all know that uh, in general, for virus disease and soil borne disease, there is no chemical control possible until recently. So because of this, as I said, indiscriminately, the chemicals are being used. So we need to re reduce uh, the usage of these chemicals to reduce the uh, environmental pollution, reduce the cost of production, and also reduce residues in our food. So when you are spraying like this, the chemical is being drifted to many other non-target areas, including land, air, and uh, water uh, bodies. Because of this, we have uh, known this uh, endosulfone tragedy in Kerala, Kasaragod. And because of this uh, poisoning, um, many generations of children have uh, got these uh, abnormalities, genetic abnormalities. So we know how indiscriminate use of chemicals will lead to a lot of human problems and environmental problems. So the best thing is to use host resistance uh, to control these pests and diseases because it's a built-in character. It is genetically, uh, the crop will be are resistant to a particular disease or resist, um, in, uh, insect. So it is economical compared to other methods. It's a component of integrated pest management and disease management. Absolutely, there is no environmental pollution, no residues, no botheration for a farmer to select the chemical and buy it and use it. And these genes will be working uh, all the 24 hours throughout the season of the crop. So if you look at this crop improvement, uh, that is crop breeding, uh, it started uh, by domesticating the crops by early uh, man. 
and we have, we have been uh, modifying uh, our crops for last 10000 years through selection all crops we grow today were once wild plants and crops strains and genes have moved around the globe you can see that picture uh, how the maize uh, the wild maize looked uh, tio sinte and uh, how we have been able to develop maize into a, a corn what we eat today and see the variation in tomato and pepper this is the genetic uh, variability available in tomatoes wild tomatoes were very very small in size and they were tasteless and all and with very few seeds and now we have been able to develop uh, high yielding uh, tomato or pepper or whatever uh, varieties because of this uh, breeding programs and of course we should always remember uh, gregor mendel who is uh, hailed as father of uh, genetics and uh, because of his early work we learned that uh, the genes the characters are genetically controlled uh, and um, uh, earlier uh, breeding techniques were selection we started uh, later by pedigree method that is hybridization and uh, for some time we also did mutation breeding and cell culture in case, case of uh, uh, vegetatively propagated crops and now we have the uh, powerful tool of genetic engineering uh, or biotechnology to move genes from one uh, uh, organism to another organism so after this uh, very recently we have this powerful tool in our hand and when we talk about biotechnology uh generally it is said that uh, even wine making um, or dosa making bread making all are uh, part of biotechnology tissue culture is biotechnology and all that so it way started way back in egypt when the first wine was produced they were the first biotechnologists but then uh, of course uh, vaccination was um, edward jenner started this this is also uh, today we have got covid vaccination for covid is all the result of uh, these biotechnology but the real modern technology started when the structure of our genetic material dna was deciphered by uh, watson and crick so the modern until then we were just doing blindly but now uh, we all know that how the life was started life was started in water as a self replicating molecule that is rna and dna and we all know that all organisms have uh, different organs and the, each organ has got different uh, uh, tissues and each tissue has go, uh, made up of cells and as each cell has got a nucleus nucleus has got many chromosomes and each chromosome has got uh, uh, hundreds of uh, genes and uh, this gene is nothing but dna and once this was deciphered and uh, revealed to us uh, the thing is that all organisms are basically same they are all made up of dna so we are all related except rna viruses we are all dna our gene material is dna and we are all same because of this now it is possible to cross the not only the kingdom uh, the species barrier even the kingdom barrier we can earlier we were not able to make crosses between species that is called species barrier so we could make crosses only between wild maize and cultivated maize or wild tomato into uh, cultivated tomato and things like that even among animals we were able to do that when you make a cross between horse and donkey you get a uh, sterile mule so again it is not fertile so but now it is possible to move literally from one organism to another organisms like a bacteria to plant and plant to bacteria human to bacteria and that is how humulin is produced we have moved a gene from human to bacteria called e coli and we are producing insulin in bacteria so the first basic natural genetic engineer is agrobacterium tumefaciens so it causes tumors in several crop species as a pathogen but here the uh, ervinia this uh, agrobacterium can uh, has got a plasmid called ti plasmid it can move that plasmid uh, a gene from that into a, a host cell and it can uh, control the host cell so by using that we can um, uh, transfer many genes 
from one organism to another plant. Uh, wherever uh, the agrobacterium can uh, ably infect. So modern genetic modification is nothing but transfer of genes into crop plants. It is relatively precise and predictable. Changes are very subtle. It allows fle flexibility and it is expeditious. We have different methods of gene um, movement. One is microinjection, and then it's agrobacterium, this thing, and electroporation, and uh, by using gene guns, you can move that. In traditional plant breeding, what we were doing is we were um, making a cross between a wild plant and a cultivated plant to move a uh, resistant gene from a wild plant into cultivated this thing. It was just a trial and uh, error method. And while we were making a cross, only if we were lucky, we were getting all the desirable genes in the next generation. But most of the time, what was happening along with the desired gene, desirable gene, uh, many unwanted genes were also coming into the new generation. But now because of plant biotechnology or genetic uh, engineering, we are able to specifically isolate the gene, multiply the gene and incorporate the gene into the cultivated uh, this thing and so that it is very subtle and very precise. So because of this, we have been able to uh, move many kind of genes into uh, our uh, desired crop or desired plant variety. It, they may be just insect resistance, only re disease resistance, herbicide resistance, or combination of herbicide and insect resistance, and abiotic stress tolerance like drought tolerance, cold tolerance, salinity tolerance, etc., and even quality traits like uh, nutrition, shelf life, taste, color, flavor, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, 1996, exactly 25 years back, we saw the turning point in agri biotechnology or in plant production. First transgenic crops was approved in United States of America. The first crops which were released in 1996 in US were BT corn against European corn borer, BT potato against Colorado potato beetle, BT cotton against cotton ballworm, and herbicide tolerant soybean, all with plant protection traits here. There are no uh, quality traits here or against any um, abiotic stresses. So let us see from 1996 to 2000, this is the latest uh, figure available. So 2.3 billion uh, hectares are uh, being cultivated, uh, I mean, uh, under uh, this crop. Major biotech crops are soybean is the largest, that is almost 50% of the total biotech crops is nothing but soybean. Next one is uh, biotech maize, that is 31.4%. BT cotton is in 12.8%. And this is the global figure. And canola is 5.4%. The rest are uh, 1.29 million hectares. So 17 million farmers worldwide are cultivating these uh, genetically modified crops. Almost 190 million hectares uh, in 2000. Now it, is, it has crossed 190 now by 2020 and the fastest adapted crop technology in the recent history. So these are the countries where the green color is there. These are the countries where genetically modified crops are being grown. And the light green ones are the countries, they are not growing, but they are importing the GM produce from other countries. See, America, Canada, and almost South America, most of the countries, and uh, yes, uh, in Asia, we have you can see China and India and Pakistan and many other countries, including Japan, they're all using these ones. Then adoption rate is very high. USA is 94.5% adoption. Brazil is 94%. Argentina is in the third position. India is in the fourth, fifth position. So, 54% that is 19 developed countries, developing countries and uh, seven industrial countries that is developed countries are using 46% of the industrial countries. So let us see individually what are the different kind of uh, these uh, genetically modified crops. First trait is called herbicide tolerance. 
these crops allow farmers to apply a specific herbicide you know weeds are the uh, biggest enemies of our crops in india we don't use uh, chemicals to control our weeds um, mostly we use uh, mechanical methods and uh, manual methods to control our this thing but uh, recently even in india herbicide usage uh, has become very common uh, but what happens is most of the popular and uh, environmentally safe herbicides are non specific herbicides it means it can be used only when the crop is not there or before the emergence of the crop like uh, glyphosate for example it it kills everything it doesn't kill only the weeds it kills even the crops so it cannot be used when the crop is there so far the scientists thought that if you can move a herbicide tolerant glyphosate resistant gene into the cultivated crop then it can be used even when the crop is in the field so it will reduce the tillage and it will reduce the uh, usage of uh, petroleum uh, products for tractors and other machineries and it had a lot of advantage so they moved herbicide tolerance into many crops especially into soybean cotton corn and canola so that is the more than 50% of the genetically modified crops uh, uh, are soybean are herbicide tolerant resistance so roundup ready crops and then uh, sorry what is this so this is how the me mechanism was incorporated and uh, roundup ready crops are these are the ones and then uh, this is the trial plot in uh, pioneer our own dr sidra megowda is here in uh, us and our own uh, punjabi friend is here and uh, the, you can see how the herbicide tolerant crops would lo look like without uh, uh, resistance and agrivo brought in liberty link liberty link is the brand of their uh, herbicide they brought in liberty link corn and liberty link canola Uh, that is about herbicide so the maximum genetically modified crops in the world are herbicide resistant uh, crops uh, another se uh, segment is insect resistant crops so these are called bt crops so bt means not biotechnology nor bioterrorism bt means bacillus thuringiensis it is the name of a soil borne bacterium which occurs in nature in all kinds of soils and um, it is a naturally occurring bacteria and causes disease of insects yeah. <clears throat> it is discovered in 1901 in japan as a causal agent of lepidopteran insect especially silkworm silkworm is also a lepidopteran insect it causes a disease called septicemia so it was discovered as a pathogen of silkworm and they found that it can be used as a biocontrol agent against other crop pests uh, in lepidopteran insects and it became very successful because of many reasons and uh, <clears throat> this is how it works it is very specific to lepidopteran insects uh, because the gut environment in lepidopteran insect is alkaline and all of our gut environment is acidic so this protoxin protein will be converted into toxin only in alkaline environment in acidic environment it will not do anything and uh, only this insect gut has got receptors for this toxin so it is toxic only to lepidopteran insect and even we if we consume that nothing will happen to us that is the reason why it was approved as biocontrol agent so initially many countries started using bt formulations powder form or liquid form as biocontrol agents to control many lepidopteran insects in many crops especially in cabbage and cauliflower um, yes this is being used for the last more than 50 years and it is found to be very very safe and it is approved even for organic farming so now the the scientists thought that why don't we move this bt gene into the crop itself why to spray because when you spray bacterial formulations in the field sometimes because of the uv rays heavy sunlight the bacteria may get killed and it is contact in nature so the pests may not be, um, be uh, coming in the 
contact of the bacterium so they will survive and still cause damage so they thought that why don't we move this bt gene into the crop itself so all of us today what we are if at all you are wearing cotton it is invariably bt cotton so what is bt cotton bt cotton contains lepidopteran specific gene derived from soil bacterium bacillus thuringiensis introduced into it by genetic engineering so bt protein is produced within the plant day and night almost throughout the plant life that is the advantage let us see why bt cotton was approved in india almost 20 years back before that uh, we should see the situation uh, cotton in india is grown in only 5% of the total cropped area only in 5% but if you take the pesticide usage, 50% of the total pesticides were being used on 5% of the area that is on cotton. So despite this use of this much use of pesticide, we were still uh, suffering huge losses in crop, cotton crop. And if you in 2002 because of this we are, can see many many advantages so it has got cotton has got four different lepidopteran insect pests now the main one is helico or parmigera next one is spotted ballworm area vitella spiny ballworm area insulana and pink ballworm that is pectinophora gossypiella all these can be controlled by using this bt gene so this is a BT cotton field in US, uh, in Alabama. See how the health, uh, you can see the good health of uh, the crop. There is no damage on the leaf or on the balls. And now how the acreage uh, under BT cotton has increased. 90, more than 99% of the cotton area in India is under GM cotton or BT cotton. So the advantage is that it is a built-in control mechanism, toxin expressed in whole plant throughout the season, day and night, irrespective of weather factors. It kills young larvae, thus preventing potential crop damage, safe to biocontrol agents, non-target organisms, uh, safe to plants and the environment. It reduces and avoids pesticide application, and it is compatible with all other integrated pest management inputs. So, uh, increase in yield we can uh, we have seen from somewhere between 31 to 68 percent reduction in insecticide sprays has uh, come down to almost 55 percent net average profit to farmers is uh, around uh, rupees 10,000 per hectare so you can see here in uh, 17 to 18 uh, India uh, could see 11 percent more production of cotton because of this before BT cotton we were net importers India was net importer, and now we have become net exporter. And after BT cotton, uh, BT gene has been put into maize also. Maize also suffers from many lepidopteran insects like uh, 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 stock borer, uh, ear borer, and things like that. And uh, because of this gene, we have not been able to control this stock and ear borer also but also because of uh, ear borer problem is reduced even fumonisin um, fusarium infection has come down and the toxin uh, damage has come down this is how it is uh, tested in the laboratory you can see on a bt corn leaf the larva is not being able to feed and it is not able to grow and absolutely there is no damage whereas in on the non um, bt cot uh, maize the larva is enjoying the leaf and it is growing in size and it is multiplying. So this is how the evaluation is done in the field. The larvae are being inoculated onto the BT cotton and on a non-BT cotton you can see the damage. And uh, this is the uh, field uh, experiment you can see. And BT cotton is grown everywhere now in US. And we are importing a lot of maize from US so invariably 
we are eating in, uh, BT uh, maize also in India. And we are re uh, importing a lot of uh, soybean oil from US. So we are already eating uh, GM oil uh, without our knowledge. And it is safe, nothing to worry, nothing to worry. So, okay. And next is um, a drought tolerance. It is abiotic stress. We know that uh, water has become a uh, very big uh, scarce commodity nowadays. Uh, the rains uh, are being uh, scarce and uh, scare. Now we can, we need uh, um, the crop like drought tolerant, uh, this thing, this is the field ex I mean, lab experiment and see the field experiment. And many companies have come out with hybrids with drought tolerance. That is a very important trait, especially for in country like India and also in Africa. This is the, another hybrid. And the third category is disease resistant crops. So uh, as we know, there is no uh, chemical control of uh, virus disease possible. And so we need to have resistant varieties uh, these crops are armed against destructive viral plant diseases with plant equivalent of a vaccine. Uh, many crops like squash, papaya, sweet potato, potato, melon, cassava, rice, corn, and uh, they already they have developed in future even tomatoes and any crop, any, wherever the virus uh, diseases are problems, we can develop virus resistant genetic I mean, GM crops. So papaya is a very successful story. This is from a public sector uh, research that is uh, from Cornell University, Ithaca. One Dr. Uh, Dennis Gonzalez has developed a uh, genetically modified uh, papaya variety called uh, Sunrise and uh, Rainbow. They are resistant, highly resistant to papaya in spot virus, which had almost wiped out papaya cultivation in Hawaii. See that clear difference between non-GM uh, uh, papaya and GM papaya. And interestingly here, the gene was taken from the pathogen itself. It is called the pathogen derived resistance. And the gene was taken from the virus itself. The coat protein gene was taken and put into the plant and the, it expressed the resistance to that particular virus. And a similar technology was used in crops like squash by private company like Asgrow and melons and tomato. And in future, many crops will be under this category. And after Bt corn and Bt cotton, now Bt maize, I mean Bt brinjal. So Bt brinjal is actually ready in India. Many companies have developed Bt uh, brinjal. Uh, which gives resistance against the shoot and fruit borer, which is the biggest uh, menace in uh, brinjal. But unfortunately, uh, the people who are against BT crops are not allowing them by creating a lot of fear in the minds of uh, uh, people. So we are not able to get this technology uh, for the benefit of our farmers and consumers. So this is the article written by me in Sudha magazine, BT Belegolo AK Bekun Tanbut. So this is how they create the fear in the minds of uh, gullible uh, people. And uh, they are uh, successful so far in, uh, uh, in uh, stopping the entry of BT uh, Brinjal in India. But Bangladesh is the first in the world to introduce that one. And they have been successfully growing and happily growing BT Brinjal. So as I said, uh, you know, because of these chemicals, uh, uh, there was a program in uh, T it will have a lot of uh, pesticide residue. Because of this technology, we can uh, reduce the usage of these uh, harmful pesticides. But unfortunately, our policies are not allowing us to introduce these technologies. So yeah, this biotech crop uh, already in, um, in 2019, 9,931 hectares uh, in Bangladesh was under BT eggplant. And uh, in shortly, Philippines will also allow uh, this BT binjal to be grown. And many farmers groups are also, actually SC panel recommended ban on GM crops and farmers bodies have opposed that SC panel recommendations. So they know the benefit of uh, these GM crops and they actually want it. 
and uh, shameful statistics uh, is uh, about the malnutrition in a country like india it is uh, increasing from year to year and uh, malnutrition can happen due to lack of vitamins and minerals and vitamin a uh, deficiency is very common among uh, children and um, pregnant women and uh, rural women so scientists thought that if you can put a gene which can produce vitamin e in a rice in rice itself so they will get vitamin a supplement in uh, their routine diet but again this uh, golden rice is ready uh, for cultivation but again the policies are not allowing us to use them so this is how the genes were taken from different organisms like uh, daffodil and uh, another uh, ervinia uh, bacteria two genes were taken and uh, they created paddy um, variety which could produce beta carotene which is the precursor of vitamin a so the, you can take the gene from this one and also from the bacterium and make the plant to produce you can put the same gene into many crops wherever you want vitamin a production you can do. today we are getting vitamin a only from crops like um, melons papaya and carrot or oh, whichever is orange in color it is nothing but vitamin beta carotene and this is uh, you know um, uh, soybean crop bt rice so this is how on your right is the bt rice see there is absolutely no damage by insects and no sprays required and without any chemical spray uh, that is the uh, health of the uh, rice crop and if you can put this gene into basmati rice uh, we can uh, dominate the export of basmati rice in uh, worldwide markets because of heavy pesticide usage in india uh, last year um, all basmati exports were rejected by us you can imagine how much we might have lost in terms of foreign uh, exchange so similarly once it uh, it is possible means it has opened up a new uh, a whole plethora of opportunities to move different kinds of uh, um, uh, genes like we can make our uh, peppers more sweeter and more more firmer and all our vegetables are highly perishable we can put them uh, put the genes of long shelf into that uh, virus resistance insect resistance good flavor good color high sweetness high firmness nematode resistance and you can literally make tailor made and ripening control of bananas pineapples slow ripening is uh, preferred by farmers because once they harvest if they can ripen slowly you can move them to different uh, far off markets and get better price and in banana black sequoia is a big uh, disease problem and uh, bunchy top of banana is a big problem we can panama wilt is a big, big problem we can develop resistant varieties for all these important diseases and even the scientists are uh, uh, working on vaccine delivery through these uh, bananas if you can make bananas or muskmelons to produce vaccine so you you can easily vaccinate people by making them to eat these fruits and even as i said these are the fruits we need more of uh, shelf life and blight resistant uh, potatoes protein rich potatoes healthy potatoes so because a uh, potato is um, rich in starch when you fry them it absorbs lot of oil and which is not good for health but when you make it protein rich it uh, it is rich in protein as well as it uh, absorbs less soil and it is more healthy and frost resistant strawberries and as i said literally plant can be tailor made to produce pharmaceuticals to plastics you can make any gene and make it like a factory and it will produce anything and humulin as i said in the beginning it's a life saving drug earlier we used to get our insulin from uh, uh, slaughtering animals and uh, many people used to have allergy to animal insulin but now we have been able to produce human insulin in bacteria by this technology the very first biotech product health product was humulin and now we have many vaccines which are made out of this uh, recombinant dna technology our own shanta biotech has developed uh, for diphtheria 
and that, uh, varieties of uh, viruses and bacteria, these kind of vaccines. And Bharat Biotech, everyone in India knows Bharat Biotech today. Okay, so, uh, yeah. You can see this um, Dr. Krishna Ella. I know him for the last 40 years. He was in Mysore when I was doing my PhD. We were very good friends from then. And you can see my son uh, having a chat with uh, Dr. Krishna Ella. He is our family friend. I'm so proud of him. And uh, he went to uh, US to do his master's. He was just BSc agri graduate 40 years back. On a rotary fellowship, he went to Hawaii University. He did his master's and then went to University of Wisconsin. He did uh, uh, PhD in biotechnology. I uh, came to India and started Bharat Biotech and it is the, one of the leading biotech company in the world. They are the biggest vaccine manufacturers in the world, especially to African countries. They are supplying all kinds of vaccines at a very low price. And uh, today they were one of the first ones to develop uh, vaccine against uh, COVID, I mean, uh, the coronavirus. And I am one of the beneficiaries. I got uh, both the shots already, uh, Covaxin, and I'm very happy and very comfortable and uh, very confident. So, Dr. Ella, so how these technologies can be used, especially in human health and agriculture? This is the best example. Of course, our own uh, uh, woman in Bangalore, who is called Biotech Queen of India. And she is just my daughter of an ordinary middle class person who was a brewer in United Breweries in Malia's company. And um, Malia, you know uh, where Malia is and where uh, uh, our uh, uh, Majumdar is. Okay, she is uh, a leading um, uh, biotech person. She produces industrial enzymes. She wants to produce insulin, uh, oral insulin, and uh, vaccines, etc. Uh, hats up to her, and we should all uh, be very proud of her. So now the question is: Is biotechnology a panacea and gives all this? Is it a silver bullet? That is the question. My answer is: It's not a panacea. It's not a cure-all, but it can only work with other traditional approaches. Sometimes not a cost-effective uh, solution but it's a very powerful tool to expire our crop improvement and our health uh, segment. So even uh, many uh, detractors are there, many opponents are there for these uh, genetically modified uh, crops, but the father of green revolution, Dr. Norman Borla, what he says is very important. He says that uh, food, food is the moral right of all, who are born into this world, and uh, we cannot take away that right from anyone. Okay. So Albert Einstein says that imagination, imagination is more important than knowledge. And uh, Dr. Uh, Norman Barlock showed that innovation is, application is more important than innovation. Okay, innovation is important, but application of your innovation is more important. He was a pathologist, plant pathologist like me, but he, be, he could bring in revolution because he became a breeder later. And after developing those varieties, he became an extension scientist, went to all the countries where such varieties were required, like India, and convinced the people to adopt those technologies. And he's a great humanist. And because of this, he got Nobel Prize, though there is no a Nobel Prize for agriculture, he got it because he is the man who saved billion lives. In the history, no one has saved so many lives than uh, Dr. Norman Borlaug. Even India has honored him with the Padma Vibhushan. Actually, he deserves Pad uh, Bharat Ratna. And he says, uh, in Albert Einstein says, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. So thinking out of the box is very important. So coming to a little bit of my work, think different. Uh, you should know what are the old thinking and you should come out with new thinking. So because of our new approach, we have developed certain products 
we don't call them as products, we, we call them as uh, solutions to the problems. So we focused on the plant root system to get more yield and more resistance. So we developed a product called Phyton T uh, using the theme of more root means more fruit, more leaf means more life, more greens means more grain. So root is the uh, organ which supplies the raw material to the leaf. Leaf is the kitchen where the food is produced and uh, the chlorophyll is the cook. So we try to increase all these in one product, uh, in a plant system so that we could get highest yield. So we have been able to solve many problems in Mysore and Mandya district and other areas. So even last year, we solved many problems, unknown problems in tobacco and other crops. Even we have solved problems in pepper. So this is in Kerala. So even crops like uh, chrysanthemum, any flower crop, any vegetable crops, if there are any uh, diseases or other problems which are not easily solved, we have been able to do that. So papaya, uh, as I was telling in case of um, uh, Hawaii, uh, transgenic papaya has been developed against a virus called papaya ring spot virus. The very fact that Genetically modified crop has been developed means that crop is important. Secondly, that disease is very important. So, but we are not able to grow such resistant varieties in India. But we need papaya because it's the most important uh, fruit crop. It's a tropical fruit, which is available throughout the year. Uh, everyone wants to eat papaya on a, day, a daily basis. It's a poor man's, uh, poor man's fruit because it's the cheapest fruit. And it is patient-friendly fruit because even diabetics can eat this fruit. But unfortunately, it is affected by uh, a virus called papaya ring spot virus. This is the kind of damage it can cause. This is, this is the kind of infection it can have. And uh, there won't be any fruit setting on the infected fruit. And even if there are fruits, and it will be not marketable and not edible. Excuse me. <clears throat> So there are many uh, theoretical management uh, suggestions by uh, people, but it doesn't work. Transgenic papa is the only uh, answer, but uh, we, we don't have the access to these varieties because of our policies. So we have developed a product which is uh, based on plant extracts, which is totally non-toxic. It is systemic in nature. It is compatible with all other uh, pesticides and nutrients. It is very economically priced. It's very eco-friendly. It's a probiotic, not an antibiotic. So it boosts the resistance or immunity in the plant system against the virus. You can clearly see the difference between untreated and treated. So the treated plant, the infected plant was uh, treated and it has recovered from the infection and uh, growing normal leaf. See, this uh, plant has been affected. The, uh, see how it has recovered from the infection. See, it is in the farmer's field, and the 100% infection is there. After the treatment, see how after one month, uh, the plants have become normal, and two months, you can't make out that it had infection at all. So this is to Professor Niranjan, uh, who is the farmer vice chancellor of uh, Gulbarga University. I took him to see the crop, and I had to show the earlier situation in the form of photograph. Uh, otherwise, there was no symptom of virus at all. So how the difference between uh, uh, before in treatment and after treatment, this is Professor Manavarachari, the famous pathologist from Asmania State University. This is our own trial. Clearly see the untreated row, untreated row, and there are absolutely no infect, uh, fruits on the infected plant. And uh, just next to them, full of health and full of fruits. This is clearly demonstrated. Many of you have visited. This is two months old uh, papaya crop fully healthy and uh, still yielding heavily. And whereas uh, the virus were infected ones have absolutely no fruits. Professor Mahadeva visited uh, our obituaries to him because he recently passed away. 
and professor uh, dr s ayyappan sir who is the former uh, director general of indian council of agriculture research dr niranjan dr rajshekar and this is the team from uh, university of i mean uh, indian institute of horticulture research uh, dr ashwath is uh, um, attending this program he had come with all his colleagues and this is former vice chancellor of uh, horticulture university bagalkot this is present vice chancellor of the same university and his team all horticulture university team had come to visit that plot she is uh, dr reno agarwal uh, principal scientist of cftri you please see the yield of the plant despite infection it has recovered and yielding this much and of my own uh, phd guide professor shekhar shetty visiting the one plant is having three branches full of fruits and these are the famous virologists professor muniappa professor uh, maruti gowda and professor uh, subramanian shastri all uh, veteran uh, leading virologists of the country they have visited see the yield full of health and full of uh, tasty fruits so similarly the same product works against different viruses and different crops like tomato leaf curl virus uh, see here how the lower portion is full of virus but the lot newly emerging leaves are healthy cucumbers how it has recovered and yielding normally and even in uh, ornamental plant like orchid see the lower leaves have got full of virus see how it recovers and this has come in all media including international media this is in prajavani this is international fresh plaza is the international uh, online media this is tropical fruit uh, fruit network all have covered this and uh, this is just uh, day before yesterday's newspaper we have been able to save even the dying trees especially neem tree has got uh, some unique uh, root problem and they are uh, wilting uh, this is called doctor tree uh, because of its medicinal value it gives so many medicines on our daily life but uh, that has become a patient and i have we have been able to treat them and uh, bring them back to life so and uh, taking this virus work i went to greenwich university in london and uh, they were very happy and they said we are working on cassava mosaic virus so cassava mosaic virus is the most important virus they have uh, developed even transgenic uh, uh, this is the symptom the uh, transgenic cassava plants resistant to Uh, this particular virus but unfortunately we can't import them and grow them because of the policy and uh, see the difference between uh, a susceptible non transgenic cassava and resistant transgenic uh, cassava what we have done is by using our product power plus we have treated and you see here the lower leaves have got the infection but after the treatment it is growing normally and i will show you the difference the difference between treated and untreated and now it is a staple crop in africa and uh, the dr maruti gowda uh, came to visit our this thing you can see the difference between uh, untreated uh, leaves and treated leaves and see the yield what is more important is finally for the farmer is the yield look at one plant is giving 27.56 kg we had not given enough space for this plant actually if we give you can go easily up to 30 Uh, kgs per plant if we grow 10 uh, 1000 plants we can uh, expect somewhere between 25 to 30 tons of carbohydrate per acre so what i want to tell you is that the man who has bread has many problems the man with no bread has only one so for those who are opposing gm crops they are all happy people rich people they don't know what hunger means so they should always think of hungry people how can we produce enough food for these hungry people and ultimately the science should be used for to improve the lives of the other, others that is what our lewis pasteur says uh, with this i want to conclude by saying jai jawan jai kisan jai vigyan thank you very much
Thank you, sir, for the wonderful uh, talk. You took us uh, from a gene revolution to a green revolution to gene revolution. Amazing thing. So now uh, it's our uh, time for uh, interaction. Any uh, queries or any clarifications, you can just ask. Otherwise, put it in the chat box. Thereby, we can take up the questions. And Sir is here to answer uh, all of you. Please uh, put it in the chat box. Ah, yeah, please. Mm. Dr. Samson, you can just. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Vasant Kumar, sir, please. Come on, no, no, Dr. La. <laughs> Vasant Kumar, sir, please. <laughs> Vasant, I'm going to check the box. Sir, Kelly, sir. Kelly, sir. Kelly, sir. Kelly, sir. Kelly, sir. Kelly, sir. Yes. Yeah. Sir, I'm going to put the lecture of Bala Chanagito, Sundarwagito, excellent Agito. Jotege Namgela Bala Sulboagi Artaitu. Congratulations and keep it up, sir. Thank you. Sir, my question as Tamagutiro Hage Tobacco Mele. Hmm. You are an expert gene specialist. Hmm. As you know, that uh, tobacco is a killer uh, uh, product. Hmm. Adana government to Saha, it is encouraging growth. And Vigna Nigalu Saha. Wulla Tambaku Bellary, Wulla Dudworth and Tahir Taitare, other Prati, Yen to second game of Bavakti, Akalika Marana Hondutaira to correct her. Idena, complete Igi, Pariaya Vavaste Madlike, Tauno Saha, Tri Marta Idiranta, Nanagutu. Adukuda yellow one kade, newspaper Raidana, the clipping tosundre, Tambaku Belgar, our Sahaya Marta, Chanagi Rodan Bellido. And the Idu Ultra Virus Salvaidu, Cholagi, Namge, Yesto, Wolde, Ahara Sikrasaku, Terbekare, is I'll not deplete Marate, Amele Vishka Vishakarika Adana now Hogena, E. Timely, Covid Timely, Nami Oxygen Beke or two, Hoge Beka Gila Adana Tau, Antkundira, Chanagi, Tamgutu Yelanono, Adrigina Nama request to. Daivito, Tambaku Belegar Rige, Nimma expertise Upios Kundu, Tambaku Belio than a complete Igi, Sarkara Mardalero Kelsana Tau Mardre, Besh. Hats off. Thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for appreciating my talk. Secondly, I want to answer your question uh, privately because this forum is mainly for students. And this is not pertaining to my topic today. Uh, I will be very happy to contact you personally and answer all your questions, sir. Uh, kindly excuse me because this is university forum mainly for students sir, and Tau, only on genetic uh, me, engineering and green uh, Food security, Pagya Matadre. Yero Vole Sundrava, the boom in Atagondo, Vishakarika Bele, Belial Sarira, and Advondo. Sir, that is it. That is a question to be asked to the government, not to an academic group. answer Martini, maybe at the end. Now, will let me take questions from the uh, students on the topic of the day. And then, uh, if time permits, I will definitely answer your questions. Please bear with me. Kindly bear with me. Kindly bear with me. Kindly bear with me. Mm. Sir, Ashwat, sir. Sir, I'm sorry. Ah, okay. Sorry. Uh, wonderful lecture, uh, Rasan Kumar. In fact, I wait for your slides. Your slides will be excellent. So that is very, in fact, I, uh, uh, one thing uh, uh, which uh, probably students in the in the, I just wanted to tell that now, in fact, the production, war production is the problem. So that yeah. probably you should tell because agriculture scientists now always we tell about uh, production is a problem, population is growing. But in fact, last year, first year estimate, not the advanced estimate. So they do not know where to store the rice and the wheat. And uh, if you see the potato, it is 50 million tons. What we require is around 30 million tons. 
so this is another uh, thing which you know like it is uh, of course it is uh, different technologies only has made this uh, lot of uh, you know like a uh, production uh, so probably if your talk would have been on uh, you 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 nim idu eno resistance bage baala chanagi helidre that is where we have to now improve the nutrition and uh, the uh, uh, what is that uh, uh, pesticide residue otherwise yeah. production is over production we are not able to sell the farmers are in a very very disgusting way whether uh, whether it is a potato whether it is a onion whether it is a, a papaya see it is crossing 300 million tons horticulture food we are not able to sell and uh, rice now the, the recently we had a meeting with the dg he was telling that they, they do not know where to store the wheat and rice that is the situation today probably the credit go, goes to farmers and scientists like you and me nanage enu antantandre this is the forum where we had to tell that we have really achieved the production but now the thing is now we have to go for a nutrition and safe food that is where our biotechnology our uh, uh, and your knowledge should uh, you know like uh, connect more that is what is my uh, humble request that's it thank you nice nice lecture really thank you very, very much slide. okay thank you thank you thank you thank you gopal right. sir hmm okay that uh, sir uh, watan kumar sir namaskara sir very interesting talk sir thank you uh, i did my phd on waste and development uh with regard to this uh, problem in india we have got no proper plan for land use planning and we have got 10 to 12% of the waste land as you said probably gmo will be the answer for our future food problem many exactly. say the food is production is increasing at present but for the future we have to plan ahead and your lecture is very very interesting sir with regard to malimat i would like to say as you said for banana it can be a very good banana with proteins and likewise also is it possible to grow tobacco in a better way where instead of getting the diseases will it be possible to have the proteins through the tobacco thank you sir thank you <laughs> anything is possible as i said uh, you can tailor make anything sir only thing is you have to work out the need and the economics of it and anything is possible you can literally move any kind of gene from one organism to another organisms it is all possible sir the technology has given that uh, you know the key to us thank you for your interest sir Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, sir, I am uh, Dr. Gurudev Singh. Okay. A uh, forestry scientist. Okay. Uh, but uh, my observation is uh, there are many colleges. under college undergraduate and postgraduate colleges yeah they have started the biotechnology course yes but without any facilities and without any teachers faculty. who are experts faculty in teaching my request to you is whether you will be able to provide training for the students maybe an introductory training so that they will understand what is this biotechnology what is the genetically modified plants so this is my a uh, question as well as advice yes sir we can definitely try sir nice. we are not doing it now but we can definitely do it sir thank you, thank you very much for the wonderful idea yes thank you hello 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 no. hello dr rosant kumar yes sir can you hear dr manjunath sir manjunath Uh, good evening good evening professor uh, dr vasant kumar good evening dr malini good evening uh, and uh, uh, i am really excited to uh, hear your lecture it was uh, full of information and uh, you have been able to present uh, the current scenario of agriculture in the entire world and uh, what are the problems associated with that agriculture and how best uh, 
the problems can be contained uh, using uh, various approaches. And uh, you have really highlighted very nicely about uh, biotechnological approach in the management of uh, uh, problems associated with uh, the crop uh, crops. Uh, really very, very uh, nice way you have presented my compliments to you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, uh, my uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Malini for having arranged uh, such a, a, a lecture. And uh, I am aware that you are quite enterprising and uh, uh, workaholic and you have been able to come out with uh, solutions to many problems associated with uh, plants and one of the examples is uh, the problem associated with uh, uh, papaya and recently uh, I am aware that you have been able to do a lot uh, to overcome the uh, dieback uh, disease of uh, neem. Uh, really my compliments to you and hearty congratulations. Thank you. So for having presented and you have made it very, very uh, interesting, not only to people like uh, me, but also to students. I think uh, the students uh, uh, must have really enjoyed your talk. I'm immensely pleased. Thank you, Thank sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Vasant Kumar, I have a just question. Is it possible to tell me? Really, sir. Congratulations. A really, nice sir. talk. Uh, applications of innovation is important at the head of the introduced our present Prime Minister, when he was uh, CM of Gujarat, the transgenic uh -huh. cotton was introduced in Gujarat. Mm -hmm. uh, stealthily, it was introduced by cotton growers of Gujarat. And the government was forced to accept the technology and release it to the farmers. Now he is our prime minister. He should take a call and uh, review and revisit why these uh, GM crops are being stopped, by whom, what is the interest of the country, what is the interest of the farmer, what is the interest of the nation. They, he should consider, form a, um, a panel and experts committee, and they should take a call on releasing all these crops. When Bangladesh is using BT brinjal yeah. for many years and they have been successfully growing it without any problem, why Indian farmers are not allowed to use these technologies? And yeah. we can introduce many other uh, crops like that, uh, drought resistant corn. Why don't we need drought tolerant corn in India? Drought tolerant yeah. uh, other crops. We can, see, it's because of this ban on GM crops, everyone has stopped investing on further research in this area. Yes. Otherwise, by this time, you would have got many more crops with many more traits. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. even companies are, see, government is investing on biotechnology, research, and education yes. in the country. But at the same time, they only are not encouraging biotechnological products. Yes. That is what uh, when you are allowing biotechnological products in human health, why not, why not in agriculture, in crops? Isn't it? Yes. So see, this is see, unfortunately, Dr. Subramanya, mm. uh, our far, scientists are not uh, uh, very uh, vociferous. They are not articulate. I'm sorry, with due regards to them. They do, they are very good doing doing research. And but they we have proactive. failed in communicating the benefits, the myths and uh, truths of these uh, technologies to the general public yes. and especially to the policy makers. See, the uh, active uh, antibiotic people are more articulate, more uh, vociferous. They can communicate, uh, they can create any myths and spread that uh, myth to every segment of the society. Yeah. See, that is where we have failed. This is the duty of scientists also. I'm happy yes. I'm sitting with uh, Dr. Malini, Dr. who Malini. is also a science writer. 
I am as a science writer. Dr. Manjunath is a science writer. Dr. Angadi is a science writer. We have tried our best. Though we are private people, we have tried our best to communicate this to the general public. So there, this, this, is, this should happen in a very large uh, scale and at a national level and international level. Then only we can break these myths. Okay. Thank you very much. Nice. Thank you. Huh? Madam, uh, thank you very much for arranging nice talk. <laughs> thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Yeah. 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 Okay, so we don't have any questions, okay. uh, I hope. And now I request uh, Dr. Samson to do both of that. I wholeheartedly thank uh, Dr. Vasant Kumar for uh, excellent speech, sir. <laughs> so uh, you took us literally through the history of Green Revolution. We could understand the ups and downs, its potential obstacles too. And at the same time, you encouraged us to look into the research aspect. We could uh, really understand and appreciate the role of biotechnology, planned biotechnology especially. Yeah. And I am very confident that you have instilled interest in our young minds and our researchers yeah. so that uh, they can look forward to build a career in molecular aspects. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor G. Amant Kumar, Honorable Vice Chancellor, University of Mysore, for providing this uh, opportunity and uh, generously providing all the facilities. And my special thanks to our beloved chairperson, Dr. Uh, Professor S. S. Suturu Malni, uh, for constantly organizing such events, which has not only educated the younger minds, but also has conveyed a serious uh, message and awareness to the public. Thank you very much, madam. And at the last, I but not least, I thank all the participants for making time as students, research scholars, and uh, scientists. And I also thank the uh, IOE team members, technical staff, for the smooth running of this program. Thank you, one and all. Thank you.